This video documents the results of my investigation into how to improve some shortcomings of the SDI Technologies Direct Time Entry Alarm Clock, marketed under the name of Timex and iHome brands as model T123 or T123S. This is basically a good alarm clock with a nice large LED display and what I'm sure is the easiest method of setting time and alarm on any clock made. However, it is rather cheaply made and has a history of failures of the number entry keyboard. In addition, while this clock's alarm cannot be accused of being quiet, many reviews criticize it for not having a loud enough alarm. I hacked into the clock and mapped out the keyboard with the idea of connecting a more robust keyboard in place of the original, and also to figure out how the alarm sounds can be made louder. So far I have not actually replaced the keyboard, but with the information presented here, any person comfortable tinkering with electronics should be able to rig up a nice keyboard. I did have some success with the alarm volume increase. After removing four screws from the bottom of the clock, the top lifts off and can be laid next to the clock base. Three small screws may be removed to allow the main clock circuit board to be lifted free of the case. This is not necessary if you are replacing the keyboard, but it is necessary if rigging up my suggested alarm circuit hack. First, the keyboard information. This photo shows marks I made on the circuit board of my clock's keyboard. The board is simply an array of momentary push-button switches wired as a matrix to nine wires coming from the main clock circuit board. Here is the schematic diagram I drew of the clock's keyboard. The following video snippet goes into more detail. The Timex T123S, when it's equipped with a keypad on top, uses a typical matrix scan type keyboard layout. In this schematic, keys 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, AM, 0, PM, and then time set, alarm set, alarm on, alarm off, and three parallel wired switches for the snooze button are all part of this matrix. <clears throat> There's a 10 pin ribbon cable that goes to the main clock board starting with the front of the clock. The first one is numbered A, after that they are not numbered so I've extrapolated the rest of the letters going up through J. I don't know if that matches uh, the intent of the clock designers but that's the way I've got it on this schematic. The first few A, B, C, D, E drive columns and the rest of them drive rows. Pin J, which is the last one, is actually a ground. It's connected to the ground of the clock and it's wired on the circuit board to have small capacitors from the ground to each of the other lines. These are marked with numbers such as C1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Um, I couldn't find a marking for this one, so I just showed it as C whatever. Uh, however, on my clock, there are no capacitors installed here. The actual matrix addresses are shown here. So, uh, for example, the time set button uses the intersection of A and G. The alarm set uses the intersection of A and I. So what that means is if you go to the time set button and you start out with A, go over, follow it up, go to the time set button, go through the time set button, follow it over and it goes to G. So the time set is at the intersection of A and G. Now for the alarm volume hack. Here is the schematic diagram I drew of the clock's power supply and alarm speaker circuits. The following video snippet goes into more detail. In trying to hack the Timex T123S clock for purposes of improving the speaker volume, I had to first study the power supply to see if it had enough capacity and an appropriate voltage to be used for a louder uh, sound source or oscillator or buzzer or whatever. Uh, essentially the transformer starts out with a 120 volt transformer. I did not measure the secondary voltage. It's a very very small transformer. I'm sure it has a very uh, low capacity, uh, low ability to deliver much current. It has a normal diode bridge here 
each diode bypassed with a small capacitor. There's a small filter capacitor. I think it read only 47 uh, microfarads. I may have misread that. It may have been 470, but it's a very small capacitor. This further reinforces that the draw on it is very low because if there was much current being pulled, such a small filter capacitor would be ineffectual. Uh, then there's a small voltage regulator. There is a Zener regulator here. So current flows through the 620 ohm resistor, a 5 volt Zener diode, and provides a 5 volt reference to the base of Q2, which is a S8050 type surface mount transistor. That ends up providing a voltage of approximately 5 volts on the emitter of the transistor. That is applied to both the clock circuit through a diode with a filter cap and through another diode to the speaker circuit. Similarly, the battery, which is two uh, cells equating to 3 volts, is applied through a diode to the clock circuit and through another diode to the speaker circuit. Going back to the rest of the schematic here, the transformer is also tapped off with a couple of half-wave rectifiers and then a small Zener regulator paralleled resistors to get a bit more current through there. And um, I did not check the voltages on those but they are used to drive the LED circuit and um, apparently use the same ground return although I didn't ring that out. It's not important for the purpose of this discussion. Now on to the speaker circuit. The clock IC actually generates everything as far as the alarm tones. So it actually provides a square wave uh, signal and when that gets more aggressive it pulses in more aggressive patterns but it's always the same frequency and it's always the same signal level. So the more aggressive tones that happen the longer you let the alarm run are due to modulation of the uh, or pulse modulation of the output frequency rather than amplitude modulation. It's approximately 4 kilohertz and the signal goes between 0 volts and just shy of 1 volt. It comes straight from the clock I see goes through a 10k resistor into the base of Q1 which is another S8050 surface mount transistor and that goes through a 560 ohm resistor to ground and that sinks the current from this power supply here through a small inductor through the transistor through the resistor to ground. Uh, every time the signal goes high it turns the transistor on and that sinks current through this path and builds a field in the coil. Whenever the transistor turns off, which happens whenever the signal here goes to zero, this is essentially open and the field on the inductor collapses. Uh, that creates a high voltage spike which is applied across the piezo element providing a much louder uh, vibration on the uh, piezo diaphragm than you would get if you just ran it off of 3.5 volts. I think that's a fairly clever circuit. I hadn't seen that before. And uh, it's a very small inductor. I don't think the voltage is very high, but I didn't measure it. There is a loud, soft volume switch on the clock. And when you put it in loud mode, the switch bypasses the 560 ohm resistor. So it pulls more current through there. Uh, if you put it in soft mode, it allows the resistor to be there. Now as for the speaker hack, I was unable to figure out a way to get a louder volume out of this. The coil could be increased somewhat. It might hit the piezo element a bit more. I don't think that would be very effective. It might damage the element. Uh, secondly, there's no room in the clock case for a larger diameter piezo element, and I don't think that would make it much louder. There's very little voltage available and very little current available from the power supply, so I didn't think it was very 
likely that I would come up with a louder uh, sound source in here, whether it was tying in a, uh, a buzzer element with its own oscillator, or building my own oscillator circuit with a small speaker, or doing anything like that. Everything seemed like it was very limited by the power supply. Now the signal here though is at a good level. It's right around one volt, which is a good line level signal. So what I ended up doing was tapping off that signal right from the clock chip going through a DC coupling uh, capacitor. I used 10 microfarads with the plus side towards the clock chip and then drop the resulting voltage across a 10K resistor to ground and then put the stereo phone jack across that resistor. And I used a stereo one so I could use a set of stereo computer speakers and both sides, the tip and the first ring, are wired in parallel so they both left and right get the same signal. And then the, um, the sleeve of the jack goes to ground. So it's a very simple addition to the circuit and it doesn't change the way the rest of it operates at all. I first investigated how to adjust the volume of the built-in piezo speaker element. Even though I was ultimately after an increase in volume, I first want to show you how the volume can be adjusted more than the clock's two-position volume switch allows without actually making the loudest alarm sounds louder. The speaker volume control resistor is this tiny surface mount component located where the pencil tip is pointing. This photo shows the volume control resistor unsoldered from the circuit board. And here are two small leads I soldered to the circuit board where the resistor used to be. To illustrate volume control, I used a small trim potentiometer with a 1000 ohm value. I connected two test leads from the trim pot. One test lead came from the pot's wiper, and the other test lead came from one end of the trim pot's element. To an ohm meter and set the trim pot initially to the same 560 ohm value as the original volume control resistor and then reconnected the test leads from the trim pot to the leads on the circuit board. I then set the clock to ring the alarm and was able to adjust the speaker volume over a wide range using the trim pot. For an even softer volume, a larger trim pot than 1000 ohms could be used. Instead of a trim pot, a small panel mount type pot could be located somewhere through the clock's case for volume control at any time. Notice that for this volume control to work, the clock's volume switch must be set to the soft position. When I was done with this volume control test, I replaced the original volume control resistor with a small 560 ohm resistor as shown. I had lost the tiny original and doubted that I would have much luck soldering it back into place anyway. Now for making the clock's alarm louder. As described in the earlier video snippet covering the schematic diagram, the clock's internal power supply voltage is quite low and has very little available capacity to power any add-on circuits that might be used to make a louder alarm. So my solution was to leave the clock's built-in alarm alone and augment it with an external audio amplifier and speaker. I first had to locate the correct place on the circuit board where the clock IC's alarm signal could be tapped into. This photo shows two narrow circuit board foils between Q2 and D14. I scraped the green coating from the foils and carefully soldered two thin wires. The wires used were the kinds used for wire wrapping, but many other kinds such as magnet wire would work. The white wire is soldered to the circuit ground or common foil, while the red wire is soldered to the thin foil that zigs around between the clock IC and the transistor base resistor R30, which is marked R3 on my schematic. The white wire could also be soldered directly to the left end of R30 as viewed in this photo. These are the same point electrically. I selected an 8th inch stereo phone jack, also known as a 3.5 millimeter stereo phone jack. Radio Shack and other electronic stores carry such jacks. Make sure to select a jack intended for panel mounting. The part I used was Radio Shack part number 274-0249. Since an external amplifier will be used with the clock, it is necessary to modify the clock IC's alarm signal to make it compatible with the audio amplifier. 
the alarm signal varies only above the ground or zero volt level, whereas any audio amplifier is expecting a signal that varies both above and below the ground level. The easiest way to make this level adjustment is by connecting a series capacitor between the clock's alarm signal and the new stereo phone jack, and then bias the output side of the capacitor to ground through a suitable resistor. The clock side of the capacitor will vary only positive in relation to ground, while the jack side of the capacitor will vary both positive and negative in relation to ground. I use the 10 microfarad capacitor and a 10,000 ohm, also known as a 10 kilo ohm resistor, and with these component values, the clock's alarm signal will not be significantly loaded, and the 4 kilohertz signal will not be significantly altered in terms of its tone. This photo shows a handy way of mounting the resistor and capacitor to the jack, with a wire passing through both left and right channel pins of the stereo jack, and the other side of the resistor connected to the jack's ground pin. I located a good place for the new jack on the back of the clock case in the location shown by the black cross, and then drilled it as required to fit the jack. Make sure to clean up both sides of the hole after drilling so the jack does not sit on a ridge of plastic around the hole. The jack was mounted as shown in this photo, with resistor and capacitor leads positioned for easy connection of the signal wires. The signal wires were twisted for neatness, and routed as shown along the front edge of the main clock circuit board at the bottom edge of the LED display circuit board. The idea here is to keep the wires as far away from those two large red wires coming from the transformer to minimize inductive coupling that would cause noticeable hum in the external speaker or speakers. After mounting the main circuit board into the clock case, the signal wires were then routed alongside the ribbon cable that goes to the keyboard, and then routed along the front edge of the keyboard circuit board before crossing over to the jack. Scotch tape was used to secure the wires. Note that the jack is located on the opposite end of the clock from the transformer. The wires were then trimmed to a suitable length to reach the jack, and then soldered to the jack's resistor and capacitor, with the white wire going to the jack ground and the red wire to the plus end of the capacitor. The clock case was then put back together, making sure to first put the cosmetic covers onto the two switches. The clock modification being completed, I have a short video snippet to show how it worked out. This is a test of the speaker hack. Right now the speakers are turned to minimum volume. Arm should go off momentarily. And it's currently set to the softer alarm setting using the native alarm. These are just generic computer speakers. There, that's the soft alarm. That's the louder alarm. And then if you find that that's not loud enough, Since the T123S is apparently the only alarm clock currently available that uses a keyboard for direct time entry, it is a shame that the manufacturer does not go the extra mile to make a better quality product. Hopefully, if you experience keyboard or alarm issues with your T123S, this video will give you insight into how to fix some of the common faults. And if you are interested in perhaps retrofitting the clock's innards into a better enclosure with a quality keyboard and a louder alarm, this video will help you in that kind of project.